going to kick things off. My name is Chris McConnell. Welcome to the Reap Speaker Series. Um, Donovan will probably fill you in on some more events upcoming, but today we're looking at uh, the clean energy uh, pipeline in Alaska and workforce pipeline. And part of my job directing the Alaska Network of Energy Education and Employment is looking at all the sectors where Alaskans are getting energy training and where those might lead to career pathways. And I think, um, you know, the the metaphor of the pipeline is overused, but still helpful. And so I thought it would be good to see different junctures on the pipeline and some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that each of those, the, the guests here today occupy. Um, and so I am gonna sort of introduce as we go along to the folks here. And I'm gonna start off with the, the visitors from Kuselvak Academy. Um, it's from the Lower Yukon School District with a um, CTE presence here in Anchorage. And so the director is Conrad Woodhead and two of his students. Um, Conrad, can you tell us a little about Kuselvak? All right. So yeah, my name is Conrad. I'm the director right here at Kuzovac Career Academy in Anchorage. And we are a program within the Lower Yukon School District. Lower Yukon has 10 village sites. And about four or five years ago, started having conversations about what it would look like to provide career and technical education to our students. We looked at a couple different options, including building our own facility in our region. Uh, problem with that was the $95 million price tag and trying to find industry experts to come to the region. Uh, and so we kind of flipped the model and uh, our school board uh, had um, uh, supported a vision of purchasing the old Longhouse Hotel here in Anchorage off of Wisconsin Street and um, having that be an access point for our juniors and seniors to come and access current technical education and uh, Alaska Middle College uh, School through a partnership with the Anchorage School District. And so our kids uh, go uh, for four of our sessions, we have five sessions in a year, for four of our sessions uh, access all the career and technical education courses provided by um, King Tech High School here in town. And so what's really nice about our, our program is that traditionally, if, if I went to a boarding school in the state, I, I had to go for an entire year, whether it be Galena or a Mount Edgecombe. And we're a quarterly model. We're the, we're the only quarterly residential option for students here in Alaska. Uh, there's other two-week programs in, in Alaska. Um, but what's really nice for our kids is they get all the benefits of, of being here for nine weeks, which includes uh, you know, independent living skills, living in a, in a, in a residential center, um, having a schedule that they have to keep, um, garner, garnering a, a ton of credit because we offer uh, quite a bit of credit because we have an extended school day. Um, attendance is through the roof 100% because they're right here. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it really gives our kids a, a, a jump. Uh, when they come here, uh, especially with credit acquisition and especially learning about the different careers that are out there for folks. And so we have a ton of different partnerships by being in town, including our partnership with REAP. And Chris has been instrumental in helping provide our students with access and, and just uh, possibility and, and uh, all the things. Uh, and we blitz our kids with options hoping that something sticks uh, with them as, the, as they make their post-secondary plan. And so uh, I, I brought Paul Isaac and, and uh, Heather uh, Tamaganuk, I, I forget the G. And, uh, and they're just, uh, they've been uh, model students with us, uh, have really leaned into the idea of uh, having a good solid plan when they leave here. And uh, I'm I'm happy they're able to join us today. So. Thank you, comrade. And and um, I'm going to be charged charged with hustling things along. But Paul, um, I'm using this metaphor of a pipeline, and so the the most valuable pipeline is is that entity that's inside of it. And so that's you and Heather here. So just tell me a little bit about your journey. What what community did you come in from? I came in from the community of Marshall. So, uh, and so, sorry, I cut you off there a little bit. When, 
you know, no one likes the question, what are you going to do with your life? But Marshall, through Kusavak or just your experiences, how is it that you look at something and say, hey, I'm, I'm potentially interested in that or I want to dip my toe in the water? Is there something that catches your eye in that world? Uh, life with Marshall is kind of bland and nothing really interests me there. But when I came here to Kosovo Career Academy, I got a lot of options of what I can do. And one of them that caught my eye was uh, nursing or welding. Nice. Putting putting things or bodies back together. I like I like that theme there, Paul. And you know, you you touch upon like life in Marshall versus life moving outside. And I think that's that's a challenge to a lot of our Alaska communities. Um, Heather, if I asked you the same question, are you do you have your sort of eyes set outside the community or are you feeling like you you may want to stay in the community? And I should ask you the same question. Where did you come in from? I'm from Hooper Bay. Um, I'm from Hooper Bay and uh, back at home, nothing really interests me, but um, there seemed the opportunity to come to KC. I wanted to try something new and I was never expecting there would be so much more opportunities than there is back at home. Thank you, Heather. You know, we hear a lot, I think, in uh, Rail Belt and Rural Alaska about soft skills. Do you, both of you, this is a question for both of you, do you feel like you've developed some skills sort of being in an urban environment um, that is going to assist you? And I wonder if you could sort of maybe talk about that skill set, even if it's, you know, people get homesick I, often at your age and just the, the ability to operate outside your comfort zone. So this question is about soft skills, right? Yes. Uh, I, I'm currently learning what a soft skill is. They're in my class. I don't know much about soft skills. Um, but what I'm thinking that the soft skill would be on time, punctual. Uh, organized and good with team teamwork and and Kelly and Heather before I move on here I'd say like a great soft skill is your your presentation here today and so you you've added you know value to us I appreciate um, your insights and so I think uh, human to human is one of the biggest soft skills and you guys are doing well on that score um, I'm gonna bounce over to um, the horticulture teacher over at King Tech High School, um, or excuse me, agriculture. Sorry, Kelly Valentine. Um, and you're on mute right now, Kelly. And hey, how's Kelly, it going? Kelly is in the middle of a class. So this is a, a, a actual day in the life of a busy teacher. Kelly, can you describe um, your program there and maybe what the students are up to right now? Yeah, so we um, we cover a lot of ground, as you know, in um, in uh, Alaska and especially Anchorage, we don't have a really huge agricultural economy. We don't have giant cotton and wheat and corn farms. So our horticulture, which is converted into an agriculture program, is much un very unique compared to what you do in most anywhere else in the world. And so, with that in mind, we cover a lot of um, more subsistence um, subsistence type activities, including hunting, fishing, berry picking, and wild harvesting of <laughs> plants as medicine. So I have nope, that's fine. I'm sure we'll be walking around and checking out your classrooms. But again, continue testing in your rooms until we can get back. So I'm uh, over at Wendler Middle School now because our greenhouse collapsed. So we kind of have to just kind of work with things as they come. So Wendler Middle School has made room for me to be a part of their program. And so I'm here now. We share space. And uh, at the moment, my students are working on landscape design. And so they're working with APU. They're designing a patio for the president of APU's um, house there. And so we're got looking at different like rocks and gravel, um, sand, mulch, plants, pavers, different options for a nice patio for them. My AM class is actually at Windler. We're redesigning their courtyard. They have a kind of an overgrown 
courtyard. So we're doing some tree removal, putting in some gardens and space for students to learn and relax, as well as um, the indigenous education program might be doing some like they said they skin seals in that courtyard. So a bit of everything that fits right in with my program. Um, you can probably see in the background, we got a lot of hydroponics going. So we're doing traditional hydroponics as well as aquaponics using fish for the nutrients. And um, we're doing a small plant sale. It used to be a lot bigger before our greenhouse collapsed. So I got students back here transplanting tomatoes, getting those going. We have a lot of herbs and tomatoes going and getting into broccoli and cabbage and all that good stuff. So that's kind of a, a real high level view of what we're up to at the farm and food program at King Tech. Kelly, thanks. You know, I think at, when we, again, um, to lean into it, the pipeline uh, metaphor there is where's the actual job sometimes people say. So through this program, you you know, I think all of us recognize um, there's not a, a huge greenhouse industry gobbling up students ready to go, but it goes back to what we're hearing industry-wide are soft skills and i think the the term of the phrase is um cross cut skills and it really at this stage of the pipeline i think the importance is exposure to different avenues and so i mean hearing about the patio at apu obviously we could you know trace seven career pathways from that mini job site there and so I, I always like to ask this question. I know a little bit already. Kelly, what was your background? Because I think you, previous to becoming a teacher, did have a position that was sort of directly related to agriculture and clean energy. Yeah, so I've been in the farming food kind of big industry for maybe 20 years, including like landscaping and restaurant work. And um, my first kind of real professional job, I guess you could say a career job, was working at homeless shelters, running their kitchens which was kind of interesting about seeing the, the food system from that angle as kind of like almost the trash can of it, but people thinking we could still use this trash food to feed thousands of people, and we did. So that was a really interesting perspective on food waste and creative usage of um, borderline food. And then from there, we went into, I started running a farm um, with guys in rehab for the same rescue mission. So worked for three and a half years on a, a small fruit and vegetable CSA outside dirt farm on a 200 acre farm that had every kind of animal imaginable. So it was a large operation. I was in charge of a small section of including like an orchard management. Um, from there, we moved to Alaska and I went to APU, got a sustainability degree looking at food systems. And then while I was there, I started working at Seeds of Change. So I spent three and a half years at Seeds of Change running their hydroponic farming program with transition age youth, helping them get job skills and ready for the work um, industry. And I was able to come from there into King Tech. And I've just really been excited, loving teaching this program. We put in an orchard last fall. So that was really exciting. And over by, you can almost see it from King Tech or from Kern's window if he changed his view and it wasn't buried in snow. So yeah, we got a lot of <laughs> different stuff going on. Being a farmer, you got to be pretty resilient and like roll the punches. And that's a very good example of here for my students seeing like, well, some stuff works and sometimes your greenhouse collapses and you just got to keep showing up to work and farming because people need food. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And you know, those of us that that look closely at the workforce in Alaska and specifically energy workforce, specifically then clean energy workforce, I think Kelly is that example. Alaska scales up differently. We don't have as many people. We have fewer job categorizations or or jobs in those categories. So I think Kelly is directly in that clean energy job world, but he also fills a, a niche that is really important in Alaska right now. And it's that train the trainers. We need the sort of people like Kelly that are able to multiply people with similar skill sets. Um, and that those are real jobs. We often hear, oh, you know, the clean energy revolution, I think a, a mistaken impression there is that with that is, is a tidal wave of new jobs that are part of that when in fact, it's the same jobs, the trades um, that build Alaska over the last centuries they're adapting. And so I think that's what I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm hearing and sensing and knowing all of you is where this pipeline is. It's a gradual but certain um, forward momentum in, in the jobs, how they're changing and their training and their nature. Um, I'm going to jump over to, thank you, Kelly, um, the principal of King Tech High School, Kern, um, who is 
got a great project in the in the works or um in the hopes it's it's i think really well thought out and now needs capital behind it but i think it ties a lot of the the knots further down our pipeline and and current if you want to give a pitch for king tech high and then we can maybe jump right into um the alternative energy greenhouse idea Sure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me today. And also thanking Reap for having me today. Um, yeah, King Tech High School, we've been serving students in the Anchorage School District since 1974. Uh, we serve uh, upwards of uh, 2,500 students a year in all of our various programs. Uh, the vast majority of the programs that we offer have some level of industry recognized certification attached. So that helps students uh, enter the workforce uh, at the entry level. And uh, we also work with students on what entry level means. Entry level doesn't always mean low pay. In fact, we're showing students all the time that with this uh, increasing labor shortage, uh, where it's a, a buyer's market at this point. So, um, you know, students are really in a right, at the right spot in, at King Tech for that advanced uh, training that they wouldn't find in a comprehensive high school. We also have partnerships with UAA and UAF for dual credit, uh, where students can walk away with not only a certificate, but credit earned that can be used either after graduation or later on in life to pick up uh, more advanced education in the field. Also great relationships with uh, our trade unions and students uh, being offered yearly uh, access to apprenticeships. So, you know, uh, each, each of our programs is very unique and specialized, and we're always looking for you know, different opportunities and uh, different ways where we can really be progressive and moving forward. Uh, and that's where this um, uh, renewable energy, sustainable food project uh, I have in mind comes in. And I'm going to try to uh, pull a uh, image up of that here. Um, if uh, Donovan and I got a little uh, back and forth, but in the meantime, describe a little bit of just the, the physical structure of what this might look like, if you could, Kern. Sure. You know, uh, for 45 plus years, there was a, a, a very large hothouse. It was sort of a, uh, an enviable hothouse. Anybody uh, in the grow industry that came by campus uh, was enamored by how big it was. Uh, but with the size and age of that uh, structure came a high level heating cost just to keep pipes from freezing in the winter. So we were looking at uh, $7,000 a month just to heat an empty greenhouse. Uh, and then structurally, we're looking at some different things too. Um, and you know, when we brought Kelly on board, we wanted to shift from just horticulture and plant, you know, hanging plant sales to um, sustainable food, and really start getting at the uh, food security issues we're facing, and then also renewable energy uh, as well. And as you can see in the uh, rendering of the vision of what the structure might look like, you can see. You know, there's the re renewable energy pieces in there with the solar panels, wind turbine. Uh, you you know, the indoor grow space would be uh, around the back. Um, so you have to kind of visualize what that might look like. And then thinking about uh, where we are with different industries in the state with indoor growing, and then the possibilities uh, to, to span across the state into rural communities. You know, we have a very effective partnership with the Lower Yukon School District. So, you know, the attitude for me is, uh, you know, I want to I want to nurture through nu uh, nutrients. Right. I, I think st our, our young people today, uh, they're surrounded by the natural world, but there's a lot of artificial things running through through it. Right. So food has become less natural and more artificial. We have food deserts here in town. Um, so we have that food security issue. And so for me, at the heart of the matter is teaching students where the, the root of energy comes from, which is food. You know, with young, uh, without a human eating good food, energy levels run low, uh, lifespan issues. Uh, so really it's about health and well-being. And so if students can understand like the human food energy source connection and how we've harnessed other energies in the world because we've been well-fed, uh, then they can get a better sense of like, you know, uh, where we are as, as humans in the universe. So uh, this project is going to be interdisciplinary. Uh, it's going to connect, um, let's say, aviation maintenance with wind turbine repair. It's going to connect uh, our construction electricity class and our electronics class with a solar panel. We want to really directly connect the solar panel 
usage into the indoor growth space. Um, there's also what's called Agritech. So we wanna connect our IT program to uh, what Agritech is and how it operates uh, with different sensors and ways of collecting data, uh, which is very useful. Uh, and then we wanna put our vet assisting program out there, uh, have chickens using the eggs to uh, uh, move into our culinary program, growing lots of green and fresh herbs uh, for our culinary program. Uh, I'd like to have a nice small kitchen out there so we could serve the public uh, with the foods that we're making that are in that farm to food concept. Um, and so, you know, uh, this rendering was drawn up uh, a couple of years ago, about five years ago. I looked out at that space and said, man, this is an eyesore. I think it needs to change. And I just started percolating ideas. And this is what I landed on. Kern, I, I think this is like one of the most exciting things going around, both just in the clean energy space and it, it has its finger right on the pulse, I think, of statewide. It, it would seem replicable. I know it's at a ren uh, artist rendering stage, but one of the challenges we know is how quickly the technology is moving in clean energy. What I like here is that it, it seems like it's ready to be iterative, and it also makes that connection to it's not just here's a solar panel kit, let's put that up and understand how to construct it and how it generates power and storage, all of those things obviously crucial, but that holistic look of, hey, this is a skill set that might not be your direct uh, correlation to, to your day-to-day -day job. But certainly it raises, I think, the energy literacy. Um, and I think that you know, this is the kind of thing, if you have your crystal ball and, and you wonder what Alaska is going to look like in 20 years and some of our hub communities, that why shouldn't some of our regional training centers be doing this in the shoulder season or when it makes sense? And how does that relate to the power generation that is happening to our microgrid villages that are using systems and people have to become familiar with battery storage and switch gear and all of those things. So even if you're not a tech expert, when you come out of there, that exposure is, I think, um, priceless. So I, I wish you well, and hopefully anybody listening or here can partner up with you in, in making this proposal reach the right desks. Yeah, thank you for that, Chris. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to come over to um, a, I think, a treasured um, agency in the state, and that's Jackie Braden over at Rural Cap, who um, I think if we, again, look at the pipeline, Rural Cap is an agency that is both um, on the ground throughout the state and has a, a big presence in the rail belt with employees that are hired um, both remotely in the community. So as a hiring agency, as a training agency, I think um, Jackie's here to give us sort of big picture. Jackie, tell us a little about Rural Cap and yourself. Yep, so my name is Jackie Braden. Um, I am the Community Development Program Manager in our Community Action Resource Center. Um, so I have three three touch points, which is that I get to the privilege of working with communities on whole community plans, on looking, and of course, energy and workforce development are crucial in those conversations. And so I get to work with communities on self-determining their energy future and having those conversations about what does it mean to be energy sovereign? Um, what kind of improvements do you want to see? What does your community look like in 10 years and how do we get there? We are also the longest running uh, weatherization provider in the state um, and for you know, over 50 years now have been providing weatherization services um, in rural communities as well as um, housing services, so building houses. And we have uh, a model for how we do workforce development in community with community capacity building um, at the individual and community level that we're really excited to bring in to the you know, energy paradigm shift or this expansion of what does it mean to go into a community not as an outsider coming in and saying, we're gonna bring you 10 construction workers and they're gonna fix your house but teaching people, develop, doing skills development um, in community. Uh, and also we are the uh, owner of our for-profit subsidi subsidiary, uh, Rural Energy Enterprises, which you may know as Alaska's largest purveyor of Toyo stoves. Um, and so we're really excited, not only to think about green technology, cleaner energies, cleaner technologies in our households and communities, but also the de decarbonization in community that comes with the and that holistic 
what is education and service from pre-K Head Start all the way to our elder programs and your home and your house and your life and how do all things intersect. Um, much like Kern and um, that drawing, it was such a wonderful, I'm like still kind of processing that, that drawing because it's like so wonderful to see um, how integrated um, all of these elements are inter interdisciplinary these are because we have to be up here. You know, we don't have the, as Chris was saying, the privilege of, of having silos the way you might in larger communities. Thank you, Jackie. And, you know, I, I think that it's rural cap also, I think has that understanding in some of um, Conrad's students there, you, we see that tension between staying in our rural communities and leaving the rural communities. And so if you live a subsistence lifestyle, it, does it make sense to talk about training for a career? Is that is that possible? Some people do. Some people, you know, work um, two on, two off and return to the communities. But I think that from my experience um, visiting communities and seeing some of the folks that have gone through Rural Cap is that um, capacity development on what does it mean to be a weatherization tech? What does it mean to be a weather installer? And so having a perennial source of training that um, for even if it's short lived is a paycheck. Um, and also if it addresses gradually that train the trainer gap of, are there some people that have been weather is it weatherizing in the community for 10, 15 years? Um, and sometimes it, it seems like from conversations with, with Jackie that the for-profit entity is looking at the rail belt in a new light as we have, um, money for infrastructure coming in, potentially a green bank, is there an opportunity for that sort of um, clean energy tech weatherization force? And so there is a, a blossoming new sort of career sector, I would say. Um, what, and, and I'm Jackie, I know this is not your sort of wheelhouse, but how do you engage with uh, local labor workforces? What's the sort of rural cap way? Yeah, the Rural Cap way is uh, fun, which is we show up. You know, we we have our communities outlined years in advance because we know that you can only do weatherization in community every ten years because um, then households aren't eligible again, which is kind of nitpicky. But it allows us to kind of scope out where are we going next. Um, so my coworker Shelby, who would be better here than me in some ways, but is too busy uh, without an Elam. Right, he goes to Elam. He says we're going to do this thing, and he goes house to house and talks to people, signs people up. Um, is an ambassador for the program. Um, and in many of our other communities where we've been before, we have local ambassadors now for those programs who say, this is a resource that's coming in, really excited about it. Um, and then we start looking at um, crew leader, who in our communities um, is, has the experience, has been doing this for a while and can step into that crew leader position. And then what kind of you know, effort is it going to take to get folks who are in community um, ready to do this work. And a lot of those barriers are imposed externally. A lot of those barriers are, you have to have this level of training um, to you know, do this work, even though a lot of the folks we work with are really good at installing windows. They know how to do this work. Right. Um, so sometimes the barrier is just putting some letters after somebody's name uh, that allow them to, to do this work. Um, but that model, you know, we are so excited to not only step into this new energy space with new funding and think about um, what does work walking with community look like, but also be, you know, step into that space as a thought leader of what does it mean to be an organization where a lot of our employees, over half of our employees um, are outside of Anchorage and they walk into worlds. And how do you be an employer that is, um, someone can be both um, in community, in an indigenous community and have a job in a way that doesn't ask them to make sacrifices to either of those identities. Thank you, Jackie. And it, it's the visibility. Well, I love that phrase, walking in two worlds. And, and there, there's an opportunity for sort of visibility to opportunities to the folks that sort of Kern and Conrad are um, teaching. I I also know that Rural Cap and Kuslovak Academy are in conversations. And so I just want to jump back to hear a little bit of Conrad's perspectives um, on that the relationship with industry and how it's sort of important the the career visibility is for your students. Sure. So, 
Two things, uh, our message and my message to students, because I meet with our students uh, every every night when they come home from King Tech, is that uh, some of the best subsistence hunters for those of us that lived in the bush that I remember had had good jobs. They're either slopers or seasonal jobs. And so uh, I, I, I tell them whether you want to be the best subsistence hunter or not, it, it's a really good way to be a good subsistence hunter is to have a good paying job because you got all the nice toys and the outboards. And, and the four wheelers and the ammo and the guns. And so we do message that a lot with our kids just so they understand that, listen, the village will always be there. Um, you know, but uh, uh, I go back to, to the villages that I taught in and not a lot has changed. And I just remind folks that, listen, there's nothing wrong with going out, getting trained and then coming back to make your community a better place or be seasonal and always have that be home. Uh, so that's an important message that we give to kids. Uh, when I talk to partners, uh, the big the big gap that we're trying to fill is when a kid walks across that stage in May with a plan in their head about what they want to do, uh, how do we recapture that kiddo in the fall uh, through um, uh, after going home? And, it, and it's really tough because uh, a lot of our kids, when they come here, they develop uh, some expectations, they develop a work ethic, they develop um, you know, really clean living and uh, 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 the independent skills that they're going to need to be able to carry themselves through. Uh, but sometimes their situations back home uh, offer offer some pitfalls and 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 get in the way of their ability to launch in the fall. And so, when I talk to our 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 industry leaders about what's needed next, it really is the idea of placing those kids and capturing them right after high school graduation, so that they will launch. So whether that be through a training or whether that be through a paid internship that comes with uh, some sort of housing or or they're out in the field learning and then training later or, or uh, leads to a job or a position later, uh, I think is a really important piece because uh, for as well as our kids do here, a lot of times when they go back to the village, they, they kind of fail to launch uh, with the plan and the expectations that they've made for themselves in our program. And so um, that continues to be a need. We continue to work on it. Uh, and again, we, we continue to just blitz our kids with all sorts of different options. Some of them that could lead to internships that carries them through the summer. Some of them that have housing options, because that's really a, a, a big issue for a kid um, who it, uh, leaves their village. Uh, where are they going to stay? How are they going to sustain themselves while they get trained up? And so um, th that's the message that I, I share with our industry leaders. Thanks, Conrad. And, you know, I think that um, a lot of REAP members and, and partners uh, um, that are here today, I would I would also emphasize there's, um, I think it's widely known, but not always practiced that so many different agencies and entities are coming into the communities, and that that's a real golden opportunity to, as you say, keep those kids, but after they walk on the stage, keep seeing those opportunities. I know that, um, Heather from Hooper Bay was with you. I think uh, Rural Cap helped just recently complete a women's shelter, I believe, in Hooper Bay. And that that new building in the communities, first of all, is important, but the um, building science behind it, the technicians that work there. So I, I encourage if it's not a log book, um, you want that partnership of, hey, I'm here and here's what I'm doing. Somewhere let the community do. If you have the time, which most don't, to have an education component there, but to make that effort of this is the project we worked on and making sure that that those kids are aware there's technicians, it's a turnstile and it's a great opportunity for knowledge sharing there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would add to our initial conversations with Rural Cap came about because there was positions posted in some of our villages with no applicants. And so how can we train those kids up to become future applicants for those positions? And so we continue to have conversations about uh, trying to make that work and support kids through the summer. And uh, uh, that'll lead to uh, something sustainable uh, in the end. And so I'm going to I'm going to put a plug in for Annie here, the Alaska Network of Energy Education Employment. Part of my mission is to help facilitate that. So um, email me or contact me if, if you want to collaborate in having your agency or um, 
entity or your personal business, your service business, more represented or visible in the community, um, which is a, a nice se segue to um, a working professional. Um, David Apperson works for Cool Air Mechanical Plumbing and Heating. Um, he is, well, I, I, I love Dave's, uh, David's workforce trajectory here. It's uh, one of the best I, as a habit, ask people about their workforce trajectory. How did they get there? And I think it's always, you get the person's story. And Dave has one of the most interesting around just in um, the Beatles song, The Long and Winding Road, um, that brought you into the pipeline. So David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thank you, Chris. I um, feel really fortunate to be here. Uh, this is an inspiring group of people to, to hear everyone's story. Uh, I grew up in Seward, Alaska, a uh, small town. My, my father was an HVAC mechanic, and he encouraged me to study engineering. And so I did. And I studied mechanical engineering at UAF and uh, worked hard as an engineer and earned a professional engineering license. And in the end, I felt dissatisfied with working inside in the great cubicle and not actually being able to put my hands on things and be the cause to, to solve problems. So I made a very difficult decision and uh, returned to my hometown of Seward and studied the Abtech plumbing and heating program. There was a lot of humble pie as I studied in that program. And then as soon as I uh, finished that, that one semester uh, plumbing and heating program, I started working as an HVAC mechanic with Cool Air Mechanical. And Kusilvac Career Academy is uh, one of our customers that we do our best to, to provide high quality uh, plumbing and heating service for. And there is a tremendous need everywhere across the state. Uh, cool Air Mechanical, our customers are commercial and industrial primarily. And so my scope of work covers everything from the, the Healy Power Plant to the offshore oil and gas platforms owned by Hillcorp to the local hospitals here in, in Anchorage and also um, some um, rural customers in Iliamna, Dillingham. And there's, I mean, everywhere in Alaska, people need clean water and, and heat for their, their homes and businesses. And there is so much opportunity for young people in this state. And the challenge is, is finding those people to, to come do the work. And so like right now, like I would be happy to, to accept or cool air would be, happy to to talk with uh some pre-apprentice applicants from from kusovac career academy or or king career center because there is there's such a need and finding uh skilled labor to to fulfill that need is is the challenge right now and i i feel lucky to have david here because i think he is one of those free agents in the pipeline that that is both geographically all over the state He's been um, a homegrown product that's higher and um, our, our vocational training. And so has a great deal of perspective. And I was chatting with him earlier. And I, I wonder, David, if you could go back to opportunity. You hear a lot of talk these days, and I think rightfully about regionalization and, you know, Alaska doing it for itself. And, and you know, we know construction and oil and gas have so many uh, employees that are not Alaska residents, and that's a out good for them, but outflow of um, resources, revenue, and and human brain power. And I just wonder, with your time in and out of the communities, what are some of the opportunities you see at the hub level, at the village level, and what are some of the challenges? Yeah, so challenges of working. So I really enjoy the real Alaska work. I grew up in Seward, and and. Um, I just feel more at home when I'm in a smaller community. Uh, so I, when I get to do the rural Alaska work, it's 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 fun for me. The challenge of working in rural Alaska is, of course, the the travel logistics, uh, freight logistics of just physically getting the parts and materials where they need to be at the time that they need to be there, and then of course finding the skilled labor to to perform the work. Um, there, there's so much opportunity. For, for plumbing and heating work, which, which all humans need, there's so much need for that in rural Alaska that whenever I'm traveling to those areas, I'm trying to find a local person who can work alongside me because uh, it's helpful for me to have, have that point of contact in the community because a, a lot of times I bring fresh fruit because you got to do some horse trading sometimes. Like, oh, I need this one little part 
And if I get it from Anchorage, it's going to be two days before I get it. Or if I trade some grapes with someone in the local community, uh, you know, I can get that thing today. And so having a local point of contact that I'm working with and trying to train at the same time is extremely helpful. And um, if someone wanted to, to live in, in any of these hub communities or even in the, in the smaller, you know, 100, 150 person village communities, there is there's so much opportunity with the with the need that they could they could work full time fixing these types of problems and 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 live whatever type of lifestyle that they really wanted to and and earn a fantastic living for themselves and their families yeah i and and i think that it's that that we're not going to grow an industry it's that train the trainer niche and that's sort of what you're fulfilling again because um i hear time and again from different industries you know we know how or many of us know how hard it is to find a plumber in anchorage or fairbanks um so obviously that's becomes exponentially more difficult the the another challenge but potential i think opportunity is you have to have that skill set of how to hang your shingle how to run a front office how to do billing and collecting. And so I think sort of, you know, championing those folks that are doing it, because there are people in the hub communities doing it, but also sort of raising their prestige and say, ask them how do you, how you do that. And I think maybe there's a responsibility for many of us uh, here for recruitment to say, hey, you know, here's a talent in person. What's, what's the missing piece here is, do you have a partner or a spouse that could, hang that shingle um and not everybody wants to but you know again because of our population size one more trade in each of our um uh hub communities it makes i think amplifies things quite a bit um kelly are are you still with us and i i want to make sure i know kelly obviously is is teaching a class so um a formal for farewell to Kelly, unless he pops back in here. Oh, I'm, I'm here, halfway here. <laughs> that, that's good. And I didn't want to interrupt too much, um, <laughs> Kelly. But um, and I know you, you've you've been at um, teaching for how long now? I'll just be finishing up my second year in about a month. So, and and so through your experience, are there is there tracking that you do informally or formal of where some of the students are now out in the world? Do they come back to you and are, are they expressing, oh, I wish there was a place to, you know, uh, practice this skill set or are they practicing in their personal life? What's the sort of, what's the vision you see once they leave your classroom? So honestly, I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to talk to my students, like reach out to them after they graduate and leave school. So I'm not sure the um, ethic of like, calling or emailing students after they leave class so I maybe need to ask about that because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to as a new teacher but um when I see students out in the community and around school I definitely follow up and I know a handful of them are involved working with like Faults Nursery and Arthur Can like different nurseries and um doing a lot of connecting with hydroponic farms in a town that are looking to hire so definitely trying to keep my students connected and, and looking for opportunities for them as they um, stay in touch with me. Um, but yeah, I'm not not doing a whole lot of tracking. I'm not sure exactly what what that would look like and if I'm allowed to, but I'd love to keep in touch and see where people are ending up. But yeah, it's pretty early still, you know, in the my teaching career. To, <laughs> but yeah, I definitely have a lot of opportunity to connect people if they're in so inclined. Thank you. And uh, hopefully I didn't get you in any uh, uh, violations there with Kern. Um, I'll find out. <laughs> Kern, what's, um, you know, we hear a lot about um, the, the challenge with spinning up a new training program are twofold. One, is there an actual job? There's all sorts of amazing trainings out there. Is there a job at the end of it? And another, I think, challenge in Alaska is even if there is a job at the end of it, this particular training we've spun up, are we getting enough um, butts in the seat? Are there enough people that sort of want that? And I'm I'm wondering as your school as an entity are you seeing 
an influx of interest? Is there, um, are you getting different types of students? I know maybe a decade ago, there was sort of a bias of, oh, you're going to shop class, where I think rightfully that has sort of eroded and, and people recognize there are so many different ways into the workforce and the, the status of a four-year college, um, you know, there's parity between the skills you've learned there. And I'm wondering, what are you seeing just from the, the sort of Anchorage student interest um, in, in the programs you offer? So yeah, I mean, uh, our, our interest level is fairly high, especially in a lot of our trade classes. Um, you know, much to what David was speaking of, uh, the idea of four-year degree, uh, more of an academic direction. Uh, for some kids, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for, for students who are maybe second, third, fourth generation college in the family. Uh, but for students who might be first generation college students, you know, they they sort of uh, live in both worlds. They they think college might be for them or they think, you know, applied technical school training might be for them. So we do a lot of work with all the students related to uh, what the benefit is in both worlds. And we also explain to students, too, that uh, the, the training, such as uh, training in Aptech, uh, you know, and, and David did speak to this, you know, and I've heard it said that uh, HVAC materials are right up there at AP reading level. So, you know, when students come to our school, we do a lot of work to educate them that, you know, you're not, it's not just picking up a hammer and, and putting a nail into a board. There's a lot more to it. There's math involved. Uh, we do a lot of work with what's called professionalism. Uh, we want students to be on time. We want them to be here every day. We want them dressed appropriately. We want them uh, distraction free. And our, our sense of professionalism is not something we just dreamed up here in our offices. It, it comes directly from the workforce. So, and, and we do a lot of work with the workforce too in terms of what they're looking for. So the strength of a CTE program is what you described, Chris. There should be uh, some certification attached or some level of training that's recognized by industry. And then there should be jobs attached to that program. Um, and then uh, on top of that, there should be a healthy number of students wanting to access that program. But I will be honest, we still struggle with the idea that uh, going to a career and technical education school or what, what was once called vocational education uh, is for the students who are just not going to college. And it's absolutely not true. We do a lot of work here to demystify that type of thinking. Um, and really what's great for us too is we have the Alaska Middle College housed here. So that's an agreement we have with UAA and students can access the Alaska Middle College, have tuition paid for by ASD as early as 11th grade. And uh, what we do is help students with college success through an advisory program. And uh, we have a 99% graduation rate. We have great student grades across the board. And what we have is students straddling both worlds. We have students who come in the building and say, gee, I, you know, this culinary class looks really interesting. Could I do that in, in, in addition to my college classes? We've had students who clearly say, you know what? I tried college out. Uh, it was nice, but I'm actually coming over to you guys and going full-time in one of your King Tech programs. Uh, and likewise, we have students in our King Tech programs who are looking at, you know, maybe I want to go to college. I see uh, certifications over there I can attain. I know I kind of have an idea what an associate's degree is. Can you help me with that? So, you know, we don't we don't particularly sell any one direction as like the recipe to success, but we really work with kids about what their interests are, um, where they find their passion, uh, what the employment world looks like. And we do a lot of uh, helping students fund their future too, because a lot of students come to us, they think about a job, they want more, but then they get this thought in their mind that uh, higher ed might be unaffordable. And so then we go to work with what scholarships look like, financial aid packages look like, you know, and what different schools offer and what the price tag on those different schools uh, look like. And at the end, what will some of the uh, job placement look like upon graduation? Um, so we, we try to really take as comprehensive approach as possible. And as Kelly pointed out, and, and higher ed struggles with this too, once a student uh, walks out the door with diploma in hand, it's very hard for us to track where they go. Unless they come back to us, it's very hard. Um, you know, we had a job fair here 
we call it a hiring event uh, two weeks ago. We had 85 employers here. The building was packed with over a thousand students throughout the day. Uh, we, we try to reach out to the employers and say, how many jobs were offered? How many interviews? And you know, because of their disclosure um, rules, they, they can't give us a number or they can't give us names. In some cases, they have a friendly relationship for us and they feel comfortable telling us, but you know, the vast majority of the employers uh, uh, are unable to share that information. Uh, but we do know students are getting hired. They come back and say, I got a job or this is great or uh, working with their counselor, they're submitting paychecks. Uh, to get some uh, credit for the work they're doing. So, um, you know, that's that's where I can lead you in that conversation. And I will yeah. jump in here and say, at least for one one success story tracking, is that our senior weatherization manager is a very proud graduate of King Tech, uh, as he called it, that, right? Yeah. And talks a lot, you know, working in other workforce development programs in with Park Service and Green Jobs. Um, for kids who don't find success or confidence in the traditional classroom environment, just watching some students really excel um, in a, a career and about a career technical education environment can be so powerful. And I think we, you know, definitely have one of those at, at Roll Cap. And he's like so he loves it. He like is such a such a fan of the program because for him it um, allowed him to to kind of start this career that he's had. Um, I think he started in welding or maybe it was electrical. I don't know. It was a long time ago. He's kind of old, but he's now in this position where he's a, a trainer and training others um, and is such a fan and vocal advocate of how that program changed his life. Thank you, Jackie and Kerm. Right, I think we're gonna try to open it up to a few questions, but one of our guests has um, holding my, my feet to the fire and said, well, I really haven't heard anybody, anything about renewable energy um, job training. And, and I would just say that, well, it's clean energy. So that's energy efficiency first. And this is not always, and it's maybe arguable, arguable, but the renewable energy jobs are for the large part like David and the other trades, whether you're, it doesn't really matter how your um, power generation is sourced. You know, it doesn't scale up to have that many wind techs in the state of Alaska right now. So there are wind tech jobs, there are solar installed jobs, there are um, geo but those really, when you get to the job site, almost everybody working there is one of the trades and their specific training programs are what are gradually adapting, I think. Um, and I'd be happy to engage off, offline with that. But in the meantime, Donovan, do we have some questions? Yeah, absolutely. We've got two in the Q&A. Um, so I'll go ahead and address those. But again, just a friendly reminder to folks, uh, please enter any questions you do have in the Q&A function. We'll try and get them here in the, the final eight minutes or so. So the first is from Dan Smith, and this is for Kelly. He said, Kelly, could you talk more about resilience and how shortening supply chains might feed into that? Uh, like your example of repurposing the trash, um, quote, in quotes, food uh, to feed people. As Kelly sprints across the classroom, perhaps. So recycling the hey there. Um, can you repeat the question quickly? Absolutely. Yeah. So it says, Kelly, could you talk more about resilience and how support sorry, shortening supply chains might fit into that, like your example of repurposing the quote trash food to feed people? Yeah. So we're doing a lot of trying to look at what's available. So right now we're even doing in our design, we're looking at how we have um landscape material you can uh, buy ground up mulch by the bag at home depot or you can buy recycled by the truck the yard that they put in a dump truck at um, american land or uh, anchorage lands american landscape supply or you can call tree companies and get it for free because they're taking it to the dump and paying to dump it so that's one where our um orchard we had I want to say 120 yards of mulch, which would have been thousands of dollars purchased at Home Depot by the bag delivered for free that they have to pay to take to the dump. And so that's just a really, uh, really just an example of what we we're just talking about as this, this seminar is going. We're talking about how we can source this material for landscape design. But um, we're looking at uh, like we got some fish over here we're trying to use their poop to um, run the the hydroponic systems, we're feeding the fish worms from our vermicompost and the vermicompost is being made from shredded up paper from the paper shredders, coffee grounds in the staff lounge and food scraps from the uh, culinary arts program. So our worms are living off of this trash of King Tech 
And then we're feeding our fish the worms from the trash and we're making some high quality vermicompost that we're using in our plants we're planting for the plant. So as we speak today, I, one of our students is throwing um, the vermicompost into the tomatoes he's planting. So I, I saw their tea in there. Oh yeah, what, what'd you say? Go ahead, Sylvia. Oh. This is Sylvia. Hi, I like to throw tea bags in there too. <laughs> Whatever compost there is, I throw in my tea bags. So Sylvia's <laughs> eating the worms from the, the tea cup of tea she's making in class. So yeah, we're we're all over the place trying to figure out. We we're doing a picking up the compost from King Tech about twice a week, and then we're working with Wendler's food and family consumer studies program to start taking picking up the compost in here and composting it on site at Wendler as well. So we uh, we're trying to get multiple schools um, composting programs up and running as part of our program. So uh, yeah, I don't know is that what you're looking for are we good all right yeah. thank you Kelly yeah yeah thank you very much so I'll uh, also just put a plug here in the chat um just in case we uh get to the point where folks are starting to drop off for other meetings so please join us again for our our next installment two weeks from today but this next question um is probably for Conrad but it says what or perhaps uh, the King Tech contingent as well but it says what is the potential for Kuzovac and King Tech career to provide education on a quarterly schedule Um, so just thinking about that question, uh, we are on a quarterly schedule with our session three, uh, King Tech session three in their day. So the way our partnership works is that <clears throat> uh, we, LYSD, uh, pays ASD uh, the, the tuition uh, cost that allows King Tech to then provide the stipends to teach in their session three class. And then in turn, ASD takes that opportunity and, and opens it up to 200 of their ASD kids from around the, the, the high school. So it's a really a, kind of a cool partnership in that uh, it exposes our kids to uh, some diversity that they don't get in their own uh, villages, uh, mixing with 200 kids from one of the most diverse school districts in the nation. And, uh, and when they walk into King Tech, it's like the biggest building they've ever been in up until that point, uh, uh, if they haven't been to the um, state basketball tournament. So it's it's wide eyed. Uh, kids are excited. Uh, and when kids come back in, I, I, I never there's never a uh, there's never a kid that's had a bad day at King Tech for us. So, yeah, great. I also I, David might appreciate this, too. I also remind folks all the time that uh, the highest paid employee in LYSD is not the superintendent or the assistant superintendent, it's the plumber. So, yeah. <laughs> And that's maybe a, a, a great note to wrap it on, up with. Um, and please, if you feel like getting in touch with uh, any of the panelists here, you can do that through um, me or Donovan. And uh, heartfelt thanks to everybody who participated and especially the students. So um, have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone, see you in two weeks.